Hey guys, welcome back to Rewild, where we talk about environment, psychology, and other fun things. This is a post I've been wanting to make about Burning Man. I was checking out the news this past week, and as a climate advocate, it was pretty intense to see that particular music festival, music and art festival, with about 70,000 people was declared a emergency this past uh, month. So I'm a little late to the game commenting on this. And being that Burning Man is a pretty niche community, it deviates a little bit from the overall themes of this station, but not entirely. So this is my second time recording this and I hopefully I can nail it this time. Some of the things I wanted to touch on are the cruelty of some people who have been spectating this disaster, discussing, hoping that folks at Burning Man were hurt by the floods. So that was a pretty niche ugliness that I saw on the internet about that. And I also wanted to discuss from a transpersonal psychology perspective some of the aspects of this festival and this community that I really enjoy and embrace. I have a background in both music and art therapy expertise, and I think that there really is something to be said for embracing communities that are really into art and music and freedom, and I think that there's a lot of idea idealism in this group that is worth enjoying. Now on the flip side, there are a lot of worthy critiques of this group. Some people have discussed it as feeling a little bit culty. It is a spiritual kind of event for some people and some people consider like the burning of the man's like a spiritual cathartic process. As a transpersonal psychologist, I think stuff like this, generally speaking, can be really healthy. But I also understand the cautionary feelings people might have when they start to wonder, hey, is this a cult? This is very alternative and strange. And as a climate ad advocate, I wanted to talk today also about where I think Burning Man ought to be going in the future. I'm not particularly hugely invested in what they do, although I've seen this intersection between idealists and artists and free thinkers and those who really embrace this festival and others who feel that it's very hypocritical especially with respect to climate emissions. Now I did some quick math this week to try to get a better sense of this and the climate emissions that one attendee going to Burning Man goes through is about 16 times more the average person's CO2 waste for a week of time and it's about four times more than the average American. People talk about Burning Man like it's a city. It's like a pop-up city where everybody drives out to this deserted lake bed and sets up all their stuff and then breaks it down like a circus a week later. And so I think it's fair to look at their emissions as a city. Right? I think that's more fair. There's unfair, like when I was hearing about this and looking into it, I was curious, how many people die at Burning Man? Is this a safe event? Because it does seem very gritty, some of the things that folks are doing, and this year in particular seemed a bit dangerous, potentially. So it turns out about one person per year dies at Burning Man, but that statistic is fairly low as far as what a statistic for a city of 70,000 people would be. Some people have said that it's expectedly low because most people who go to this event are a little bit on the younger side and more able-bodied, so therefore it makes sense that there would be a little bit less fatalities than compared to a normal city. So I took the same philosophy in my breakdown of how much does a Burning Man attendee emit in terms of CO2 emissions, and it is so much more <laughs> than if you were to just stay home. And so in my first iteration of this post, what I really wanted to say to people is my understanding and my hope that People who really love Burning Man, people who are very enamored with the spiritual aspects of this, the cathartic aspects, the community, 
You're not wrong. Participating in an art collective is a very beautiful thing. Participating in group prayer or things like that group ritual is a very healthy thing in a lot of cases. But if we want to be real, you don't really need to leave home in order to build community, to do art, to participate in art or dance therapy, or get the benefits that people get from traveling to this place. And I really want to challenge Burning Man organizers and attendees to really think about their carbon footprint, especially when I think a lot of people in this community want to be considered very progressive and at the cutting edge of this kind of stuff. That's my challenge, especially this year with this great flood, this natural disaster, especially also the intersection of climate protesters that were trying to block the road this year and the also very interesting scuffle that happened between them and indigenous people. As a part indigenous person myself, I was pretty shocked at that intersection of these three different groups colliding in this space this past month where you have burners that are going for a Bacchanalian festival of idealism. You have climate activists who are going on behalf of the climate with their idealism. We have a big scuffle happening between those two groups and we also had a scuffle with indigenous First Nations people asking climate protesters, why are you on reservation land doing this? You should be down the road where this party is. As an indigenous person, I'm very familiar with this feeling that indigenous people have to deal with a lot of historical trauma and pain around a lot of other folks' assumption that if it's native land, it's public land. Native land and public land are not necessarily the same thing. And I think it's interesting that climate activists, I wasn't in on that, so I don't know why the choice was to protest on reservation land rather than protest on the Burning Man Playa area. It could have been laziness potentially without knowing the organizers who did that. I know that sometimes it's considered easier to occupy native land because it's considered no man's land by uninformed people. I wanted to touch on that a little bit, that I think this year had a lot of intense energy and it is very interesting that a lot of burners consider what they do a type of collective prayer or collective ritual and then there were people talking about the mud and the risk to some party goers lives potentially maybe being a direct result of the scuffle with climate protesters and people really wanting those who go to Burning Man to take greater responsibility for their climate emissions. Going back to the discussion of what is the fatality rate of the city, okay, it's like a little bit less than average. I think that's like a very fair way to evaluate this festival. I also wanted to I guess illuminate some of the cliches that people who are very anti-Burning Man have been perpetuating online. A lot of people have been saying that folks who go to this festival are very wealthy and they are cosplaying poverty by participating because it's a camp out and tickets are very expensive. On the flip side, people who go to festivals and events like this will tell you that the tickets for a camp out festival are not that high as far as entertainment costs go. And there are a lot of middle, even lower class people who attend Burning Man and get their tickets paid for by volunteering or just rough it. One of the things that I saw a TikToker, I wish I could have saved his name so I could give him credit. If you're out there, you know, drop the link or if you've seen this one as well, because um, mine's buried in the saves. Uh, <laughs> there's too many to find. But one statistic that somebody was, or not statistic, a piece of historical information about the festival that someone was highlighting is that there were turnkey campsites. So the festival likes to bill itself as a celebration of self-reliance. 
And some people have said that this has really become polluted over the years and a lot more corporatized. And one individual pointed out that this comes probably from turnkey campsites where wealthy people can have very fancy caviar type snacks. They don't have to set up their own campsite. They can pay someone else to set up a luxury version of one for themselves. And they also got a private jet airstrip out there. So between those two things, I think it's really fair to identify where the hypocrisy might be when it comes to the notion of self-reliance and maybe even of like progressive thinking and visionary antics. Uh, and I just want to say the assumption that everybody who goes is wealthy, I know is a false one because I know very a, a good handful of middle class people who go and I don't think it's ever appropriate, no matter how jealous or how resentful people feel of people's wealth or lack of wisdom, I don't think it's ever appropriate to hope that people die in the line of a natural disaster. And those were some of the comments that I saw out there. So I just wanted to speak to that, that no matter how cringy, no matter how hypocritical, that's a little bit far. And I know people say things in the comments on the internet without really thinking it all the way through. People are a lot spicier behind a keyboard than in real life typically when it's face to face in front of you. But not everybody who does this is uh, worth that kind of karma or is deserving of that kind of punishment for enjoying life the way they want to enjoy it. A lot of people spend money on things like Amazon purchases or fancy alcohol or vacations and I just think that just because someone saves up all year to do something like this doesn't necessarily mean they're wealthier than you or that their choice of how to spend their money recreationally is not as morally sound as the way other people choose to spend their money recreationally. Everybody deserves recreation, everybody deserves hobbies, and I would say even a little bit of escapism is not necessarily the worst thing in the world in our current situation. That said, escapism that is intense, as what we see in this festival, is a lot. And for me personally, I find things like the private jet airstrip and the art cars that tend to spew gasoline, fire art, I find stuff like that actually a little bit gross personally. Even though it might be beautiful or convenient, it is contributing to that 16 times more CO2 emissions per person per day that we talked about earlier in this cast. And I think if burners want to be seen as these visionary people, as these bright minds of the future, a lot of Silicon Valley kind of energy, if you're trying to be disruptive to current systems and think outside of the box, this is such a huge, important opportunity to really think about how you create a festival that is sustainable. And I was thinking about it, I, I think it's very doable. And I think it's a good challenge. There's a lot of engineers, carpenters, artists, software people that go to this event that are very invested. And I would love to see some of those bright minds rally around this in the future, especially as climate gets more and more intense and as we start to see more and more risks hitting random communities like a dartboard all over the planet that this year it hit the playa. <laughs> and I know that there was a lot of glib, there were a lot of ravers there who seemed a bit offended that the news was reporting it in such a severe way. But personally, I hesitated recording this in part because I was a little bit worried that there might be fatalities this year because of that flooding, that it, it was looking a little bit disconcerting, especially for so many people. And just because vibes are high and you want to believe that this is a 
good old time doesn't necessarily mean that your lives might not be at risk or that that level of carelessness couldn't cost the lives of, say, rescue personnel that have to go in there later. I grew up around a fire station, so I'm a little bit... I was also a park ranger briefly in my life, so I'm a little bit aware of the exasperated nature of emergency personnel workers who have to risk our lives when other people are careless. And that's not to say, you know, in the end, all's, all's well that ends. I don't think there were any fatalities from the floods, but there probably could have been. And in the future, with accelerated weather patterns from climate collapse, this could become more frequent. And I think it's really important for people to respect nature and to respect those risks because you're not just risking yourself when you put yourself in a dangerous position you will ultimately very likely be risking the lives of emergency personnel workers who have to go in there and get you out if things get hard. Luckily none of that happened, the porta potties didn't fill up, but the people trucks got in there in time and there was a lot of chaos. It looked very uncomfortable for a lot of people and there were some kind of darker souls out there really celebrating the discomfort that some burners would presumably have had, but burners are very resilient and very hardy people. So they were very much undeterred, but I do want to say that as somebody who appreciates a good party, but also wants people to be safe and wants emergency personnel workers to not have to risk themselves just because people spend a lot of money and really want to get out there. It's a valid take too, that when you make choices like that and you are only looking at the positive and only wanting a certain type of reality to be true for you so you can enjoy and go about your business, um, you might be impacting other people around you unknowingly. Um, and very certainly, I think that applies to CO2. So I'm re-recording this podcast today because I realized this is everything that was in my original one, but I wanted to speak more to how I think Burning Man could become more sustainable in the future. One of the things I'm seeing people discuss a lot is the damage done to cars and car rentals. One of the reasons burners get a very bad reputation is because there's a tendency for people to rent vans and U-Hauls and then clean them really good after the event. But apparently the type of silt and sand that's out there is very damaging to people's vehicles. So I was thinking about that in addition to how much emissions these events are creating. And I think that maybe some of the wealthier attendees, the ones who have their private jets flown out there, instead of investing in that next year, maybe take that money to invest in like say a fleet of solar campers and start making those rentals internal and start designing vehicles that can handle the conditions out there in ways that don't put a level of dishonesty of wear and tear and damage ex exported onto people outside of the festival when you're renting vehicles and have them like strategically parked in other places. I think there would be a lot of Silicon Valley Tesla type people, not to promote that company necessarily, but there's probably a lot of innovators who have either thought about this or might resonate with this and might have capacity to engineer around them. And I think if anybody's going to do it and set that example, it really ought to be this particular festival. This is one of the most high profile events of its nature on the planet, and it is highly frequented by Silicon Valley business leaders who like to consider themselves leaders of the future and disruptors of existing industries to see themselves as visionary and innovative. And so that is my challenge that I think people from this community could start to mull over, especially when people are talking about reading the signs. In Hawaii, we call it Ho'ailona, our signs from nature. And there's a lot of people joking around, hey, God is angry. God is angry at the burners that this is happening. Look at you guys flooding. And I couldn't help noticing also at the end of the festival, there, there was a double rainbow or about midway through the festival, which in my culture is, and many other cultures, is usually a sign of something very beautiful on the horizon as well. I wanted to leave people with those two thoughts. I think there are good points on both sides. I can definitely resonate from 
a therapeutic, positive psychology perspective, from a transpersonal perspective around the importance of art therapy, alternative communities, that type of intimacy, that type of self-reliance. And I think counterculture is important. I think it, it helps people to create a new vision for a better world. But one of the reasons I think this group is taking so much heat is because there are very obvious ways that they could be holding that up in a more universally acceptable way. Not just paying lip service to the idea of innovation and future forward thinking and sticking it to the man, but actually putting your money where your mouth is in a really direct way. Not being the worst polluters on the planet, but maybe trying to be the least. I know there is a weird intersection with that when it comes to cleaning up the playa and trying to be zero waste and trying to not leave moop out there. That love of taking pride in leaving no waste and taking pride in being conscious in that sense needs to translate to climate emissions in the future, I think, in order for people to start to take the principles of the original founders of the festival seriously again. I hope that this insight is appreciated both by burners and Burning Man critical people alike. I think that there's room for debate and there's room for disagreement in this. And for myself personally, I would love to live in a world where there are more dance festivals, there are more people making beautiful art for the sake of art, more people taking time out recreationally. Some of the healthy get ready with me's I've seen from vegan yoga teachers and people who are living very conscious lifestyles when it comes to nutrition and health habits. And of course, juxtaposed against other less healthy habits that are associated with that community. But I like to think you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to sacred practices of dance and art and collective community. I would love to see that happen in a more genuine way, in a way that is more holistically healthy, not just for the participants, but for the planet as a whole. And it's only going to get that way if Burning Man attendees and developers start to really look at the emissions of the event and take that seriously. I think it's embarrassing and funny and hypocritical, honestly, that this event has been going on for so long. It's been going on in tandem with accelerated climate collapse and the emissions in the art cars are just skyrocketing and almost making a mockery out of it. When you see those art cars just like spewing fire and coal and I got to go to a party in San Francisco and meet with a few artists who design cars like that and they're really amazing and they're very cool and it's fun. But I have to say it, it does feel very apocalyptic and dystopic and a Mad Max movie when you think about the deliberate like the artists having to deliberately ignore climate collapse and the implications of the politics of fossil fuels in order to create art like this. Because art is also a political statement. A lot of art is, not all art, but I, I think most good art is. And there's something scary to me about that, that people sometimes are just making art to look cool. <laughs> but what is the message behind what you're making? And under a state of duress, like what we have now with climate collapse, creating art cars that are just burning fossil fuels for fun is in and of itself a political statement, whether you like it or not. And I actually personally, I, I can't speak for everybody, but I wouldn't be surprised if that political statement being made by some of the artists that attend this event might be part of the heart of why there's so much anger that is directed towards this camp. So I don't mean anybody any deep critique or harm in saying this. I think it's just worth looking at and worth looking at those numbers that to attend this event means you are increasing your climate emissions over tenfold for other members of the planet and fourfold for your other fellow Americans. And I don't know if prayer is enough. I don't know if the therapeutic aspects of that 
are an equal trade for the poor example that this sets and how it impacts the collective. And especially, I don't know about that, when we're looking at a culture of people who definitely, I think, have the skills, the capacity, and the vision to do better. I hope that people take that with a lot of love and that this isn't hurtful to anybody that's really attached. I know there's a lot of really strong emotions on both sides. And I hope small ideas like looking into like really hardy, sturdy Mad Max like solar cars and internal rental systems so there's no harm done to the outside. Even other stuff like zero waste water bladders and having compost, having like very smart ways of composting and recycling so the moop that can't live on the playa doesn't just end up in the next city over once people travel and get to the nearest trash can that they can find. I think learning how to create a zero waste, zero emission event in the future and publicly stating that's the goal and creating a comprehensive long-term plan for that would be really wise for the organizers and inventors of this festival. Thanks so much for listening in today. I hope that this was a little bit informative or amusing for somebody out there. I really appreciate those of you who've been tuning in and I look forward to hopping back on camera in a little bit. I've been needing to just take a break for my own self-care. So I appreciate y'all just enjoying the podcast and we will see you next time. Take care.